Now then, Hells, tying in with your, your thing there from what you've just said about Camilla and seizing the day and life can be short and all of that, we've got another quick interview here with, um, with a guy called Peter McCleave, who this is a story that's very close to my heart. Peter was an athlete that I coached in Team Oxygen Addict a year ago, and um, he was unfortunately diagnosed with myeloma just after completing Ironman Wales in 2016. So he started training with us, and he was feeling really unwell, and he, he took a break from the coaching and eventually emailed to say, look, I'm going to I'm gonna have to stop the training because I've got to go in for treatment with this myeloma. So he's an incredible guy. He's set up a website called 10,000donors.com to help find stem cell matches for people who have this disease. So I've, I've read about him on Facebook over the past couple of years and he's doing quite well at the moment and obviously he's putting all his energy into his website. So I really thought if we could get a 10 minute a 10 minute interview with him on help raise the profile so just sit and listen to this everyone don't fast forward through it really listen to this because it's a great cause and you could really help people out okay pete it's lovely to get a chance to welcome you onto the show um, i'm really i'm really excited that sort of you're doing better than you were last time we spoke certainly and uh-huh. to give you a chance to get your your story out to the podcast listeners a little bit so um so backstory is you were great age grouper you've done ironman wales and then all of a sudden we get a bit of an unpleasant surprise in the old health stakes, don't we? Do you want to fill us in with the backstory? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd spent the previous nine months in 2016 basically training for Ironman Wales and then completed the race in September and obviously was, was overjoyed and over the moon with, with, with that performance. And then two days later, found myself in the Countess of Chester Hospital and uh, I got quickly diagnosed with Legionnaire's sepsis and, um, and pneumonia which was totally unexpected. So, um, you know, went from the pinnacle of, of my fitness to, to being in a bit of a bad state. And then and then over subsequent months, you know, I, I assumed it would, would clear itself and get back to normal, but things were just not clearing as they should do. So um, I had a number of x-rays on my chest. There was, a, there was a shadow from the pneumonia on my chest, and it just wasn't shifting. So they took me in for an MRI scan about three and a half, four months after the uh, my, my, my admittance to the Countess. And by pure chance, and this is where I was very lucky, by pure chance, the, ra- the, 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 the MRI scan uh, was, was viewed by a radiographer who spotted some abnormalities on my skeleton. And these were lesions, which were, um, they, they were a sign of, of, of weakening, a bit like osteoporosis. Okay. And, uh, and from there, they, they, they didn't tell me at the time, but they did blood tests, and then they did another full body MRI scan from which they, they noticed these lesions everywhere. So skull skeleton uh, the chest legs you think of a bone it, it was being compromised so they did blood tests and uh, i got called in to see my doctor and was given a diagnosis of myeloma and I, i'd never heard of myeloma so um you know I, I actually said to the doctor at the time can it be clear with antibiotics and you know with a very stern face he told me that uh, it was a blood cancer and uh, and that it couldn't be cured and then subsequent conversations it came out that you know, if, if I if I got through the next seven years, then then I'd be I'd have done well with this diagnosis. So it went from you know the pinnacle and peak to almost the lowest of the low. You know, when you're telling your family, your parents, you have to manage your children. So I've got two boys aged eight and five now. Yeah. You know, you go from uh, you know very high to very low very quickly. So sure, yeah. That that's that that in a nutshell was was where we got from from Mine Wales and and they said they they think I was actually that the myeloma was there you know, probably a year before uh, the diagnosis. So all the way through training, um, <laughs> little symptoms were there, but you know what it's like. I mean, when you're training as a triathlete, you know, if you're feeling achy, you assume it's just because you've had a good a good training session and, you know, you sort of, sort of revel in it or you're a bit tired and fatigued and that's just, you know, you're working hard, you're training hard. You just put these things down to, to day-to-day living. But in reality, these are all the signs of, uh, of the myeloma sort of manifesting. So it was there during training. I just didn't realize and ignored it. So, um, you know, but again, I count myself very lucky that I was picked up the way I was because many people who get myeloma, they, they, they get kidney failure and they can end up in a real state by the time they actually get diagnosis. So, so mine was picked up. Um, it, probably sooner than, than well, I was very lucky when it got picked up because it could have been a lot worse in terms of where I, where I ended up. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, as you said, you went from you went from the high of the highs from completing your first Ironman to all of a sudden being being diagnosed as incredibly sick. How has the journey played out over the next? This was late 2016, wasn't it? So, over the next couple of years, how has how's your sort of treatment and recovery gone? 
Yeah, so uh, I was pretty much immediately, it, it was March March 2017 when I got the diagnosis. I was pretty much, you know, within, within four to five weeks, put on a regime of chemotherapy. And it didn't really work, unfortunately. So they then put me on a second regime of chemotherapy, which was very, very intensive. And that was the first time I... I lost my hair and, 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 you know, sort of became part of the club. You know, you actually start to look, unfortunately, like you have it. Whereas before, I was able to kind of fob it off and just, you know, just, just push on through. Yeah. But then that therapy stopped working as well. And so they put me on a third regime of keeper therapy, which it, 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 got, it got my body in a position where I, I might be able to go through what they call a stem cell transplant. And that's where they, I had what's called an autologous stem cell transplant. So they took my stem cells, cleaned them up, uh, then blasted me with a big dose of chemotherapy, and then they put my stem cells back in. And for those people who aren't clear what stem cell is, it's basically a stem cell is the precursor to all cells in your body, whether it's hair, whether it's skin, nose, or blood. We all, all cells start as a stem cell. So when they blast you with the chemotherapy, uh, and then they stick you in a room for a couple of weeks in isolation, the stem cells that go back in will then spot that there are, there, you know, there are good cells missing and they should proliferate and grow into good healthy cells and that's the theory. So, you know, over the subsequent year, those are the three steps that we went through leading up to the autologous stem cell transplant and, um, and I've just been recovering for the last couple of months from that. So I went into the Christie Hospital in June it was and uh, yeah, I've just been uh, getting myself fit and well ever since sort of leading up to where we are today. Wow, what a <laughs> what an incredible story in a few minutes of time. And um, well, the, the next thing is, I mean, you've just told me off air, but tell everybody what you what you did a couple of weekends ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you so, maniac! Uh, <laughs> I um, I'm just my, my 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 belief and approach to all of this is is one of proactivity. I think most people who do triathlons have a certain mindset. You know, you can sit and have a chit chat over a protein shake, and you soon realise that we're all of a similar way of thinking. So I'm sure most people empathise with it. But, you know, you can you can spend your life sitting back and waiting for people to do things for you or you can go to your backside and do them for yourself. So my approach has been to get as fit as I possibly could do and maintain a positive mental approach to this whole thing. I mean, just sitting around wallowing is not going to help anybody, at least of all me. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I wasn't expected to be fit enough, but I um, I completed uh, as a part of a relay in fairness. I did Ironman Weymouth, so I did the bike leg and it was uh, it was rotten weather. It was rainy, it was cold and wet, but... You know, it was it was kind of like me. It was, it was almost like a two fingers up to, to, to cancer as far as I was concerned because I wasn't expecting to be fit enough. But, um, yeah, got myself around on the bike and, uh, and we, you know, ran down that red carpet. And it was it was the first step back to, you know, almost when life was as good as it could be because the last time I ran down the red carpet was obviously Ironman Wells in 2016. And since then, it's just been downhill. So it's one more step towards redemption sounds a little a bit dramatic but I can't think of a better word to use it's just you know a, a further step towards me trying to trying to battle this and and you know do the things I enjoy doing of which triathlon was a huge part of my life yeah yeah good man I don't think redemption's too big a word at all I think it's, <laughs> I think it's the perfect word for it <laughs> so listen next up tell us tell us about your um your next mission basically you've got a website called 10,000donors.com tell us what that's all about and what your what your focus is again with this yeah so so basically I, I mentioned earlier on i had a stem cell transplant where they took my stem cells and cleaned them up a bit and that's only so effective there is another type of stem cell transplant called, called an allergenic stem cell transplant and what they do is they take someone who is a genetic match for me as a patient or someone else as a patient and they're able to take their stem cells and put them into my body and that they will effectively grow into a new immune system. So I'm effectively getting a brand new immune system. So I've been given a, a prognosis of seven years. If I can get myself a stem cell donor, the prognosis is infinitely better. You're looking way beyond seven years if it, if it works and works well. So it can't, it won't cure it. Unfortunately, myeloma cannot be cured, but it can be managed. And this is one of the most effective technologies that we have to manage myeloma right now. So the 10,000 donors campaign, like I explained before, is my proactive attempt to try and to try and get more people signed up, not just for me, but for everybody who has um, an ailment which can be assisted with stem cell therapy. So, you know, there are lots of different trials out there. It's not just blood cancer that the patients that can benefit from this, but um, that, that's obviously my, my focus now. But, you know, some of the startling facts for me are, you know, there's only two, you know 2% of the UK population currently on the stem cell donor register. 
which it sounds low, but it gives us a great opportunity to make some massive inroads into that. You know, we've got ninety eight percent of the population to try and you know basically attack and get signed up. So that's the primary goal of ten thousand donors dot com. It's just to make people aware, educate people, and and get them registered um, as stem cell donors. And and the great thing about stem cell donation is it. It's such a simple process. You um, you know you, you get tested by swabbing your cheek. It's no, there's no needles. There's not there's nothing nasty involved in how you get tested. It takes three minutes. Swab your cheek, and you and, and it gets sent to you at your home for free. You return your swabs in a prepaid envelope, so it costs you nothing. Yeah, and it's like donating an organ, right? If you, if you donate a kidney, it's gone. Stem cells, you've got millions of little tinkers running around your body. And, <laughs> They're regenerating every single minute of every single day. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to be chosen to be a match for someone, then, you know, you are, you're giving something for free and you are effectively, you could, you could be saving someone's life. It's that simple. So, um, I mean, I, I, it's blown my head away that so few people are aware of it, but it's, it's relatively speaking a young technology. So it's maybe not a surprise that not many people are either aware of it or signed up. So, so my goal through 10,000donors.com is to get more people aware and more people registered, not just for me, but you know, for the uh, for the thousands of people who get diagnosed. And and you know, another stark fa- fact that I've been made aware of is that every twenty minutes in the UK alone, somebody gets diagnosed with blood cancer. It's one of the cancers that no one really talks about or is, is really aware of, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. So. You know, you shouldn't, if you get diagnosed, you shouldn't have to go searching for a stem cell donor. As far as I'm concerned, it should be as readily available as aspirin. And that's kind of my mantra for this whole project. It's, it's to get that donor registered. So, you know, in a bunch of years, if somebody gets given the message I was given, the doctor can say, but we've checked the register and we found your match and you're going in next week to get a stem cell donation rather than me spending the last four or five months and however long into the future I do this, trying to find a stem cell match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It sounds, it's such a great cause and it's such a simple way. I know because you're relatively local to us, there's loads of the guys from our tri club have, uh, have posted pictures of themselves on social media. They've got the kit, swapping the cheek, sending it back. Um, and it really is just as simple as going to your website, 10,000donors.com, clicking on a thing and registering. And then who knows, you might be in a position to save somebody's life, right? Absolutely. And the great thing is, so in, we've only been running this campaign now for five weeks. In the first five weeks, we've already got over 1,300 people signed up. And I've had three people, and I was told of the third person yesterday, who've actually been matched with somebody. So they've all gone down to London and they've all been, you know, had given, done the stem cell donation for somebody uh, in the world because the, the, glo- the register itself is a global register. So, you know, wow. th- there are three lives that have been directly They've been able to directly benefit lives that could have potentially been saved by our campaign alone, and, and excuse me, plenty of other people are you know trying to trying to raise awareness. But um, you know, it's 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 incredible to know that in such a short space of time we've got that many people and three matches already, and and it can only it can only go one way, and that's up. So you know, I'll, even when I hit the ten thousand mark, which I've got no doubt this campaign will, I'll just stick a zero on the end of the target and start again, and then when Good we hit man. that target pick another zero on and start again. It's just, it's the only way to attack this. It's just making people aware and getting out there. Well, that's brilliant. Well, I'll tell you what we've got. We've got over 3,000 weekly listeners on the show and every month we get something like 7,000 unique listens. So who knows, man, if every one of those people registered, we'd be well on the way to the 10,000 donors, wouldn't we? (laughs) It would be absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, even if you don't get called up straight away, there there is a greater potential there. To, to, to impact somebody's life and it's not you know the thing that it's like any cancer it transcends race gender bank balance all the things that we get you know siloed off in every single day it doesn't matter what your background is because this this thing can sadly impact anybody and this is our way of coming together and saying screw this yeah we we can make a difference here we can we can we can fight this together and that's that's the other you know another one of my big aims is it's it's to make people aware but bring people together and find find things that we have in common rather than those differences that so so readily get focused on in the papers and the news you know wherever every day yeah man well i tell you what the the podcast community stand next to you with this one and uh, i'm really hoping we can get tons and tons of sign-ups for you um and uh, what have you got planned for next year in terms of in terms of triathlon action where can people see you man because it'd be great if they uh, if they donated and then got to meet you in person what have you got lined up 
Well, at the moment, nothing. As I say, the Weymouth thing was a bit of a was was a nice thing to be able to do. It was an unexpected thing to be able to do after the transplant. So, I know I've got one friend. He's going to Mallorca. In my head, I've still got. I'd love to go back and do Wales again. It was it was an incredible race. But um, I don't know. I've always I've always fancied doing the Norse man. That crazy thing where you jump off yeah, the back. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's it's you know it's, it's really hard to get into that. So now I'm still open to uh, to ideas as to what to do next year. But I'm definitely you know. Getting getting back and doing the full try is absolutely the key. So um, I don't know. I'll, as soon as I've booked it, I'll let you know, Rob. <laughs> well, you do that as soon as you've as soon as you've booked it. You let us know. We'll get it out on the show, and who knows? Maybe there'll be a, a little community of people pushing alongside you on race day. Hey. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, look at the very least, I'm out there supporting my friends who have been running triathlon for a bunch of years. So um, you know, I'm going to be there. If if I'm not doing it, I'm certainly supporting people next year. Great stuff. Right. So again, that website is ten thousand donors dot com. You just click the link. Put your name in and get the swab kit through the post. Absolutely. It's, it's that simple. Costs you nothing. Three minutes of your time. Brilliant stuff. Well, listen, Peter, on behalf of everybody, we, we wish you all the best with your uh, with your continued recovery, my man, and uh, look forward to hearing about, uh, well, hopefully, crossing the finish line in Wales next year. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, thanks so much for engaging with this, Rob, and for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. Really appreciate it. No problem, man. See you again soon. Cheers, Rob. Thanks. Bye. Pretty groovy, hey hells, that you can just get posted through the post, a little a little mouth swab, and who knows, you could potentially save somebody's life just by going and donating some, some blood cells. And I know a lot of people who've done that recently, um, yeah, including, um, yeah, people... He's got a lot of friends in our well. club, hasn't he? He's got yeah. a lot of friends in our club who have who've been doing this, so uh, yeah, if anyone listening can sign up uh, and and be a, be a potential donor, that'd be absolutely brilliant. We've got close to 7,000 unique listeners every month these days so if every one of you signed up Pete would be nearly all of the way there to his to his target so please do it <laughs> yeah no, that's cool right Rob some news to finish off with 